I've seen it countless times in my practice over 15 years. Patients get their CBC blood test result, take a quick glance at it, nothing's flagged, and file it away, everything's fine. But they're potentially missing critical clues about their health when we don't look at it without that careful eye. So today we're going deep into your CBC blood test beyond the reference values to uncover what your doctor and what you may have missed. We often think the CBC blood test is just a basic blood count, right? Anemia, check. Maybe infection, check. But it's actually way more than that. It's a story about your body and what's going on with your body. But most doctors are reading the headlines. And today we're going to read between the lines and connect the dots and learn how to understand the subtle clues that can reveal things like inflammation, nutrient deficiencies, and even early warning signs of bigger problems with your health. Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Terranella and this channel is dedicated to helping you improve and optimize your health. If you're new to the channel, hit the like and subscribe button to continue getting videos like this. So let's just forget about reference ranges for a quick second. Now let's say that your white blood cells are technically within the normal range. Let's say they're around nine. And the actual reference range might be 4 to 11 is a pretty classic one, but different labs are going to have that slightly different. And last year, your white blood cell count was 4.8, and the time before that, it was 4.5. So that's certainly an increasing trend, as you can see. And more concerning is the sudden jump from the 4.5, 4.8 to 9.0. A gradual increase over time could be a signal of a problem, maybe inflammation going on of some kind, could be chronic, could be low grade, maybe a hidden infection or even underlying autoimmune disease developing. More concerning is when the levels ride the upper end of the range of the white blood cells all the time. And when this is happening, you need to ask yourself why? Why is it creeping up slowly? And then also, why is it so high to begin with, if that's what your CBC is shown? And so the second thing we want to look at is red blood cells. So a low red blood cell often means anemia, right? But what kind of anemia? That's where the MCV and MCHC can come in and help us understand this. So MCV is mean corpuscular volume, and it tells us the overall size of the cells, which can be different sizes. And the MCHC means mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. That's a mouthful, but it's basically just telling us how much hemoglobin is inside each of those cells. And a low MCV with a low MCH is classic for iron deficiency. But what if the MCV is high and the MCHC is normal? That points more towards a classic B12 or folate deficiency. And to find out if we actually have that or if maybe there's just some kind of fluke with this particular test, so we need to test the B12, the folate, and see what that's telling us. We're not just going to check the box of anemia and say, well, that's what it is. We want to solve the problem, fix the problem. So we need to know if we need iron, we need folate, or we need B12. The third one we want to look at is the RDW. RDW stands for the red cell distribution width, and it's a measure of how varied those red blood cell sizes are. So meaning, do you have a bunch of really small ones and also a bunch of really large ones? that's going to produce a much bigger RDW versus ones that are medium size and ones that are large size. So a high RDW means that you have a bunch of different sizes of those red blood cells. There's lots of variation there. And it's a sign that something is disrupting the normal production. So one way this might present is maybe you're really tired and you have slightly low red blood cells overall, but actually a high RDW. And you may go and check your higher levels and they look somewhat normal, mostly normal, maybe on the lower side of normal. But then when you go and check the ferritin, that's where you see you're actually low in iron. And so that RDW is so big because you don't have enough iron to produce your red blood cells. So sometimes the RDW can be the first clue that something major is happening before you actually become anemic. The fourth thing that we want to look at is the differential. The differential is telling us about the different types of white blood cells, and it basically breaks them into different categories like the neutrophils, lymphocytes, eosinophils, monocytes, and basophils. Now, a lot of times people do understand that neutrophils are usually going to be associated with bacterial infections, and lymphocytes are more associated with viral infections. But we need to dig a little bit deeper, and so what if your neutrophils are slightly low, 
percentage wise or absolute wise, and the lymphocytes are slightly high percentage wise or absolute wise. And so technically they're within the normal range, but there's a relative imbalance. And so in this case, we would call that a relative lymphocytosis, a relative increase in those lymphocytes. And so that could suggest that you have an underlying viral infection like Epstein-Barr, or maybe there's some sort of autoimmune thing going on. This kind of pattern wouldn't suggest just one thing, but for sure that there's something going on, especially if it's happening persistently over multiple lab tests. You need to look at your symptoms, the clinical history, and potentially also bring in other labs to validate what you think is going on based on this differential of those white blood cells. And that's just one of many different patterns that may emerge. Another thing that's oftentimes overlooked is eosinophils. High eosinophils in particular, we often think eosinophils, well, you must be having an allergy or maybe you have parasites. And this can be sometimes the first clue that you're having those issues is that your relative eosinophil levels are a little bit high. But what if you don't have any history of travel to a foreign country and you actually don't have any allergy symptoms? Could it still be a parasite or maybe there's something else going on? When those eosinophils are consistently elevated, we certainly want to dig a little bit deeper to try and find the answer. Sometimes it's coming from your digestive tract. You can have something like eosinophilic esophagitis, IBS, or even mast cell activation syndrome that's triggering this process, this increased eosinophil count. And so in cases like this, you need to investigate beyond the obvious determine what the cause of these problems are. And sometimes it's not always obvious. Sometimes it's not really apparent until you keep searching. But the longer these things are off, the longer you're having these problems, the more you want to continue your search. So now let's say we have a patient that's coming in with a little bit of fatigue, ongoing fatigue, maybe been going on for at least three months, maybe six months. And their CBC is showing as follows. The white blood cells are 7.0 the red blood cells are slightly low, maybe just on the margin of being low, just below that reference range. The MCV is showing small red blood cells are low. The MCHC is also showing low and the RDW is high. Now already we're getting a sense for, ah, it looks like iron deficiency. Then we also look at the white blood cells and we see slightly low neutrophils and slightly high lymphocytes. And so because of the elevated or slightly elevated white blood cells in the presence of the highest lymphocytes, it kind of paints a picture of maybe chronic inflammation, maybe some kind of viral thing could be going on. And so we need to look a little bit closer at what's going on. Sometimes you don't have enough iron, you're not going to have enough red blood cells being produced either. And so we want to check out ferritin, we want to check out total iron binding capacity, serum iron, CRP, maybe some viral tests like Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, and even rule out autoimmune disease with an anti-nuclear antibody test. We're looking for the underlying cause of fatigue in this particular person. So to ask some questions is going to deliver you the answer in terms of what tests we need to do. We're not just treating the lab, we're treating the person. In order to do that, we need to have a dialogue with that person. And so along these lines, you need to listen to your body. Your CBC blood test that we just discussed may look perfectly normal. Everything, let's say, is in the middle. Uh, it always is. And, but you still have problems. And so you want to listen to your body and continue to search for answers. But oftentimes, too, it's not just one test. If one test is normal, that doesn't mean you give up especially when it comes to the white blood cells. Those cells are changing a lot. So make sure you are diligent with getting the tests done and comparing with the previous ones. So this is just really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding the complexities and interrelationships between these tests and the CBC test in particular. It's complex and nuanced tests that requires careful analysis, but specifically comparing multiple numbers over time can really help us understand what's going on underneath the surface. The more numbers you have, the easier it gets in making conclusions and giving you the answer. And I just wanted to mention here too, if you want a deeper dive in understanding lab tests and abnormal lab tests, there is a playlist on abnormal labs that may be helpful to give you more clues about various lab abnormalities. So here's the key takeaways to make sure you remember. The CBC is more than just about normal and abnormal. If you want to look at trends, you need to get at least three to make a trend. But if you only have two, okay, you can compare the two. But you want to connect the dots between the different CBC components and consider your symptoms and history to overlay with those things that are showing up on the CBC that maybe look a little bit off. And this is where your doctor comes in. Don't be afraid to ask why something looks the way it does. 
And if they say they don't really know, that's sometimes a better answer than saying, don't worry about it. But sometimes the answers are really obvious. And sometimes the answers do take time to understand. Again, the more tests you have, the more clear it becomes. The key is a willingness to explore and track these things over time as going to deliver you the answers that you're looking for. So after looking at this, what questions do you have about your CBC blood tests? Are there things that look suspicious? Drop them in the comment section, share them, and maybe we'll discover some things together. Hopefully this video helps you better understand what's going on with your CBC blood tests and some of the nuances that are occurring there. If you have questions, drop them in the comment section. Tell me about what you're finding on your blood tests. And if you want a more nuanced, customized answer, consider joining the membership program. We'll have more time and attention to dedicate to your question. And you'll also be supporting the work that I do and supporting this channel. Now, one question you might have after watching this video is, what does it mean when your MCV is high? You can find the answer to that question in this video right here.